Um, so we're going to touch on everything um, from, uh, I think, VR to mobile, et cetera. Why don't you guys do some intros? Hi, everyone. My name is Henry from iDream Sky. Uh, we are the publisher for Temple Run, Subway Surfers, Toy Blast, Gardenscapes. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Gary from Lan Kong. Uh, we are Chinese uh, game developer and the publisher as well. Uh, we set out office in South Korea and Taiwan and uh, also in Southeast Asia to publish games. Thank you. Hey, I'm Ringo from China Mobile Games Entertainment Group, which is CMG in short. Uh, we are a major mobile game publisher and developer in China with almost 1,000 people in different countries. I'm based in Toronto. CMG was also the first Chinese mobile game company listed on NASDAQ. We have been working with some top-notch world-class IP holders to bring high-quality games and IPs to the Chinese market. For example, uh, Star Wars, Assassin's Creed, The Walking Dead, uh, Million Rush, Dragon Ball, uh, SNK All-Stars, etc. We also have, have a different focus on the lighter, smaller Western indie games. In 2017, we published 10 indie games already, all featured by Apple and Google stores. And one of them, which is called Egg Egg, was uh, included in the best of, best of 2017 Apple App Store. I'm willing to share more details in the panel discussion. Hello, uh, my name is Sumi. I'm with 360 Games. We're a uh, subsidiary of Chiu360 out of China. We are a uh, leading online security company in mobile and on PC. We have over 1 billion users worldwide. Um, we have the, uh, the second largest Android market in China with about 15 to 16% market share. And uh, we're looking to publish PC and console games in the West, as well as bring PC and mobile games to uh, China. Awesome. So I think you know a good place to start is just kind of the overall market um, in terms of gamers, in terms of revenue. Again, let's looking at mobile as well as like PC, and I think it'll be interesting to touch on like console and VR and things like this. Where are things at in the market? Obviously, China is ascended to become the biggest market. How is the growth looking um, in market uh, overall across these different platforms? Anyone want to give some thoughts around that? You want to go, Henry? Okay. Um, everybody knows it's the biggest market, and it's got uh, probably 500, 600 million mobile game users, and everybody uses smartphone. 1.4 billion people, and the most interesting thing is, I think 10 years ago, nobody wanted to pay for games, and nowadays I found a thread on Zhihu, which is the uh, Chinese equivalent of Quora. And there's somebody asking, so where can I download uh, the pirate version of this game? And then all the people following that thread, it's like, shame on you. Like, why don't you buy the game on Steam? It's not that expensive. So nowadays in China, people are uh, having a habit of buying for games now. So back then, only free-to-play games can work in China. Once you get people to be addicted to the game, then they start paying for money. They start paying for the contents. Uh, but then now uh, premium games can have a market in China as well. So that's something I noticed. OK. Uh, I'm thinking there is quite interesting phenomena compared to Western like, countries or markets. Uh, when you uh, travel around the whole China or just walk on the street, you can see almost everyone is holding their smartphone to play games. It's quite interesting like um, phenomena if you compare to the Western country. So when you travel around the Western country, normally you can see a lot of people, they just uh, read books, something like that. But most of Chinese people, they prefer holding their iPhones or Android phones to play any kind of games, I would say. Uh, Chinese games, Western games, to be honest, they are quite open to any kind of genres or uh, if, you, if you can let them feel your games are quite interesting. So um, although there are some barrier to, to enter Chinese market at the moment, but still, I think that Chinese players, they are quite open to any kind of genres or games. Thank you. 
Well, I think the, there's no doubt that uh, mobile game is the largest portion now in Chinese gaming market. And uh, PC game, it's like some kind of old news, but uh, PC games are catching up quickly because we all know Steam China is doing so well. And also Tencent's Wii game is catching up. And with regard to VR and AR, I believe that's the future. That's a strong future, but now it looks like it's early. I think one and a half years ago, VR make, made a very big noise in China. Lots of new st VR studios and investment, but now it's like die down, die away, because it's too early for the market. But uh, I think after two or three years, VR is definitely the big player in AR or MR, whatever. Yeah, I think I pick up after Henry's point is that the mobile market's super competitive, just like in, the, in North America and the West. Um, but on PC, uh, it, it definitely feels like players are, are much more willing to spend money. And that's been sort of the story from the uh, partners that I've worked with, um, very Western-facing uh, portion of 360, uh, speaking to a lot of North American developers and uh, European developers. And that's been the big question is like, it, can they get into the market? Can they take this Overwatch or premium PUBG style where they can go premium and, and monetize in that way? Uh, and that's certainly been uh, a great option for, for us um, trying to tackle both the West and the East together. Awesome. So in terms of like the growth is obviously very rapid. Let's focusing on mobile gaming over the last, uh, say, five to six years. Uh, are you guys seeing that slowing down? Um, obviously, at some point, everybody has a phone. Everyone's sort of started playing mobile games for the first time. They've become familiar with them. Have you guys seen things start to slow down in the market? And how does that also play with, you know, you have uh, you know, two players that obviously control a large part of the mobile market. Um, how are those dynamics right now in terms of like growth? Is, is mobile, you feel like slowing down a bit in terms of revenue and market? Or how do you, what's your perspectives on that, around that question? Um, back, I mean, it was growing a lot uh, for the past 10 years, and especially since 2011. But then that was because a smartphone wasn't used by everybody. Yeah. And so that growth was following the, the growth of smartphone usage. And now everybody uses smartphone. Obviously, um, the revenue growth um, for, for gaming is slowing down. But then that's just natural. And, but then uh, I, there, will, I mean, there will be still a significant market for everybody. It's a, it's a huge market. And I think um, the, the, the users who pay money, that number is going to keep growing up. OK. Um, from my point of view, I think right now, yeah, uh, the, 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 the past of the, the whole market should be a little bit slowed down. But still, you can see that uh, more and more game developers or publishers, they try to um, use different genres or gameplay to attract different users. Like, I'm not so sure the English name. It, uh, just recently, there is a very popular game uh, called I Love and Producer. It's, it's focused on female players. And uh, it attracts huge amount of users. It's like a rom romance game? Romance. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, so it's, it's like uh, the, the, the female players, they can interact with the um, male characters inside the game. And, inside the game. and uh, I think right now, um, although the, 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 the whole market is a little bit stable right now, but still, there are still a lot of different dimension that we can explore. Thank you. Well, personally, I, I, don't, I don't see the market slowing down in any way. And although the competition level is higher and higher, but it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean the market is slowing down. It just means some poor you know, players is out of the market, out of the business. And uh, I think the, uh, the major publisher and uh, developing studio, they are keep seeking a you know, new growth point, new gameplay, new genres, and new segmentations to keep driving the growth. So, sorry, I'm gonna, can I switch up the question yeah, for you? Yeah. Cool, so uh, I want to talk about like PC and console since you, you're doing a lot there. So obviously Steam, I believe the number one country is now China. You have the Wii game from Tencent. What's that sort of marketing look like? Oh, is it 
starting to grow faster now again. And also would love to hear about like console and, you know, obviously that's more limited, but anything happening there also. Yeah, I think we're, we're seeing a lot of growth in PC market and that's sort of where we see uh, a lot of organic growth as well. Um, less paid advertisement needs needed there. Um, and it's one of the strengths for us having uh, a large PC audience as well. We can leverage that into success. Um, but certainly, you know, you're seeing a, a large uh, growth in Chinese usership in uh, like games like PUBG, uh, which is uh, about 35% Chinese, if not more than that. Um, and it's definitely uh, a recognizable feature in the game for many players in the West. So it's a growing market for sure. And I think that uh, kind of speaking to the mobile side of it, I think that uh, you're just seeing less and less uh, players, like industry guys, uh, in, in the space. You're seeing more consolidation of games with something like Tencent and NetEase just sort of running the market. And for them, the market is sort of changing, it seems like, where it's a more focus on getting users with, uh, you know, some companies just putting out multiple Battle Royale style games, really trying to corner the market, and then maybe later on monetizing. So sort of a different approach uh, for something where competition is much higher now. And you know these these a lot of the the big players can't just own the users or own the markets. They have to really fight for them. I think that we're seeing more of that now. And what about console? Is that still just non-starter based on the install base access? Yeah, it isn't a huge focus for us. I mean, certainly if we can bring a game uh, to console in China, that's that's it's great. But it's uh, you know you've seen other titles like Warframe just have moderate success to, to you know not really that much success. It's just a tough market there. Uh, PC is much more attractive for us, um, and we're even seeing a lot of games that are, are uh, you know, mobile first coming to PC to Steam as well, which um, have yielded some success. Cool. So one, you know, one trend on mobile I wanted to to talk about here a little bit is the this idea of these like instant games. I don't know exactly what they're called. Like you know, WeChat, I just announced has done a partnership with Ketchup to bring a lot of their games over to Chinese market. So. Any interesting trends around uh, these sort of super light casual games, like especially around ad revenue? Um, any thoughts around that? It seems to be kind of a growing trend uh, in Chinese market. It's traditionally been focused on IEP kind of driven games. Any opportunities there um, and growth there specifically? Um, essentially, all games are just fighting for users' time. And WeChat is definitely where most of the Chinese spend most of the time, uh, th that's, the, the, that's the biggest time consuming app in China. And so those, and recently the, the bottle flip, uh, I'm not sure what it's, uh, what it's called in English, Chinese name is Tiao Yu Tiao. And then that just went viral on WeChat and people were fighting for the, uh, being the, the, the top spot among their friends. And so, and that's a, that's a catch up game. So ten, and I guess if more people are spending more time on those games, there will be opportunity, at maybe advertisement or in-app purchase. Got it. Yeah, I think um, like Vigo said that uh, right now you can see um, Tencent is focused on HTML5 games, like Tiao Yi Tiao. Uh, right now, I, I think uh, like Henry said that before, the, the competition in, in Chinese market is quite fierce. And uh, right now, um, developers are trying to look for different directions, different way to do business, especially like uh, Lan Kong, we, 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 we take um, attention about the HTML5 games. Uh, so we, we think maybe that there will be an, another growing trend in, 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 in China. And uh, although right now Facebook or Google, they, 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 they are not, I think they, they kind of like slow down about uh, the HTML5 games, uh, this kind of platform, but still uh, in China, I think um, there are so many developers that have already put a lot of resources about HTML5 games. Yeah, I think uh, compared with, you know, a few years ago, now, in Chinese market, we do have you know different diversified monetization options for different games. I mean, like three, four years ago, you know, Chinese never you know pay for download; they just play the free-to-play game with IAPs. But now, especially for lighter you know casual games, you know, the pay-for-download model does work very well. At least for CMG uh, and some of our indie casual games, you know, the revenue from in-game advertising are much more than the IEPs. But for 
make a hardcore games to dominate the genre in China in Chinese market like uh, RPG. I think that's the most popular game, uh, hardcore game, uh, action RPG, 3D RPG, or um, MMO RPG. Those games are still heavily rely on the uh, in-game purchase, not on the in-game advertising. So, but still, I mean, compared with a few years ago, now the option is much more diversified. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a, a good option. For us, we're mostly focused on IAP, so that's sort of our approach to, uh, to, to publishing. And uh, we, we don't necessarily um, look too much for uh, licensed IPs in the West, because we don't, or sorry, in Asia, because we don't focus too much on, on casual games. So it's sort of a different approach for us. Got it. Um, so we'll have to touch on, we talked a little bit about VR. Um, you know, it seems like from what I've seen, a lot of the focus around that has been, there's always a huge boom and sort of a bust, but a lot of the usage is like an arcade, VR arcade uh, type opportunity. And love any sort of thoughts around trends around VR in the market, as well as AR. You know, I just saw that NetEase released some type of like AR glasses or something. Is there any interesting trends around these areas um, that folks would want to point out to the audience? So right now we haven't entered into the VR AR market. Uh, we just feel the market is not ready yet. Um, the install base is too small and because the install base is too small, there are very few content developers willing to develop for this market. Um, there are arcades in China, but I think uh, it's not going to last, to be honest. I mean, in the end, I think it's going to, the, the equipment, the hardware is going to go down in price and then everybody's going to use it. But at the time, then the arcade is going to be gone. So the, because, of, because the hardware is so expensive, the only way to use it is in the arcade model, just because people can't afford it at this point, basically. Yeah, because it's so expensive, only arcade can um, have it. Uh, only uh, they only exist in arcade right now. Yeah, but then uh, just not a. I guess it's not a focus for any big publisher right now. Yeah, there's just there's just no market for it. It's not an interesting prospect for for many publishers. Period. Um, and it's also just a super isolating experience to be in this HMD and to be kind of locked into this world, even if you're in a social environment in the game. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know many publishers that are actually looking for, for VR content at this time. Uh, it's not that we're not excited about it. Uh, I mean, I, I love VR titles. I love being in this, this world. But it's just not something that we can uh, effectively market and publish and make money on. Got it. Any other thoughts, Ron? But we do believe um, AR could be the next big thing to, to replace a uh, smartphone. But then it's just not ready yet. HoloLens is still too expensive. Um, Magically, we just had a PR release for the, for the prototype, but it's not out yet. So I guess it still takes a few more years. Yeah, so it seems like basically similar issues to the West, but the price point is even more of a problem uh, in, in the market for people to afford. Um, cool, so I wanted to switch up a little bit here. Obviously, you know, the market is huge, huge revenue opportunity, but very complicated. Um, so one of the you know main complexities is regula the regulatory landscape. So um, love to get some sort of insights, like what's the government sort of involvement review process involved for PC mobile games? Like love to give kind of the audience an overview of the latest around that. I know it's a very process always changing, but love to hear your kind of thoughts to educate folks around the complexity there. Um. So the Chinese government thinks uh, all kids can get their hands on games. So basically, if your game is going to be released in China, uh, the government assumes the kids are going to play it, whether it's Grand Theft Auto or, or any bloody violent or, or sexual title. So that means all games have to be pretty much PG-13 at most. Uh, it cannot have nudity, cannot have violence, and sometimes you cannot even have cigarettes. I signed a game last year, of an uh, indie game called Framed. It has cigarettes, and and I and I was told to ask the the developers to remove the cigarettes, and they even asked them to re, uh, to replace the traditional characters, the ch Chinese traditional characters, to simplify characters. I guess they think 
uh, simplified characters are more patriotic. Um, so you would assume the Chinese government doesn't play the games themselves. They actually do. They play everything, and they give very specific uh, suggestions for you to change the game. Other experiences that developers can expect? Yeah, I, I think the censorship and uh, localization changes are the one of the har hardest topics from the Western developers and concerns. And uh, a certain things to avoid, one is the adult content. It's over sexy, you know, characters, art, and violence, the gore, bloody, you know, stuff, killing, you know, body parts, and also religion, also politics. But I think the third one and the fourth one, they are very easy to avoid it. I mean, religion stuff and the politics stuff. But the first two is not that easy. Imagine that you have an action RPG game, you know, you try to avoid gore and killing. It's not, it's not so easy. And sometimes the censorship can be very tricky. When, for example, your game was rejected by the government. And after maybe one week, you'll find another game, you know, even more violent than your game. It's live in China. So sometimes sometime that can be very tricky. But my advice is that still try to you know, maintain a very good balance. That's also kind of art, right? To keep your game attractive and avoid being rejected. Yeah, I mean, clearly players want this content. It's no secret that this is, players are really hungry for this type of you know, content. It's, uh, it's unfortunate that it's been, you know, been censored in that way. But I think for most developers that I've worked with, uh, they generally tend to self-censor themselves, and they are uh, err on the side of caution rather than push the limits and try to get flagged for something. Um, and and uh, like Ringo said, some of the tougher things are just some of the more basic gore and violence in the games, just because those are core to a lot of games that we play and we want to publish. Um, but certain things like you know gambling are obviously things you want to avoid, and uh, witchcraft and superstition type of stuff, um, super easy to avoid. And you know, I've worked with teams at Perfect World and uh, with Digital Extremes and. Uh, we, I, I've rarely seen major incidents with, uh, with games that we've worked on in the past, I've worked on in the past. Cool, yeah, I've heard um, it's obviously, those are a lot of things, even simple things like the, if you have like a map, and like where the lines are drawn with the different countries, can be problematic. And obviously one that's might be obvious, but not you, you can't have any English tech. Like everything has to be localized, it can't be anything not localized, right? So. And then, in terms of the process right now, um, is it still like uh, if you're a foreign company, you can't even partake in the process, right? You have to be a local uh, Chinese company to even enter this evaluatory process, correct? Yeah. So right now, I think some of foreign companies try to um, build up the joint venture with Chinese companies to 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 get through this uh, process. It's much easier. Yeah. So obviously that's the value of working with a local partner, whether it's a like, publisher or somebody to assist you throughout that process. Um, and in terms of the time, I mean, this is, I think, one thing to focus on is this is a very lengthy process, right? Like for foreign games, I've heard most recently, like f expect like four, we have four to six months. Um, even if it's you as a local company trying to get this lo uh, foreign game through the process. Yeah, for foreign games, it's four to six months. And sometimes the Chinese di publishers want to make the game, uh, pretend the game is a, is a Chinese game. Yeah, if it's game. not released in the West yet. Yeah. That, if it's a Chinese game, it's, it only takes like one to, one to two months. I'm not sure if that's uh, your experience as well. So it's much, much faster for a Chinese game. Not for any specific reason. Yeah, I mean, the Chinese government's protection is everybody knows that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It might be a good tip, but we never try to pretend a foreign game as local game. <laughs> we didn't do that, and we won't do that. Uh, I mean, never. I think our process is for, I mean, games from overseas, you know, that takes longer time, at least a few months, four, six months, or even longer, to be honest. But for casual games, it's much quicker because, you know, the content is light, you know, simple, and more healthy. Yeah, typically four to six months is pretty normal for us. Um, it helps to have all your ducks in a row, so you have the local content ready and uh, you know really uh, be prepared for the submission process to, to, to gap into the MOC. Um, and uh, like I said, six months is usually on the higher end, but it can go more. It can be uh, additional one to two months. 
Uh, but it actually helps to have a, a partner that can guide you that process because there's a significant amount of content required um, and uh, requests that, that might be made for that, that process. Yeah, I think uh, that, that would depend on the, the genre. So, so that's why I think uh, a lot of um, developers, if they want to publish games, they will try to change maybe um, certain names in, into virtual names, like uh, or like a virtual world. Try to avoid uh, like um, the the real names in, in the world or the, the his or some names in the history. Try to avoid some this kind of, kind of conflict. That will help you to to get through the process. Got it. And just uh, and so in terms of the process. Like for mobile, uh, you actually deliver your game on a device, right? And then somebody is actually playing the game. They give you feedback. You make the changes. Maybe they make different feedback. So it's kind of this sort of like back and forth. And that's one of the reasons why it takes obviously quite a long time. Is that correct in terms of like how that kind of works, just so people understand? Yeah. So um, yeah, I, I I think so. So I think that's the the major point why. If you want to enter the Chinese market, you you should work with us, because uh, we we have I think for Chinese companies we always have some like PR people to help us to 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 deal with this kind of government relationships. So uh, so if you want to enter the Chinese market, you probably have to talk to us. That, that's not too different than what a Western developer might face working with like Peggy USK or uh, AU compliance. Uh, it's you know there's always going to be a back and forth with getting builds, delivering it, and uh, you know uh, understanding the full scope of the game. Um, but it just helps uh, to to have a partner that can help you with that because it's going to be a little more difficult. Cool. So I think moving on from from actually Gary's comments. So let's talk about you know uh, entering the market as a Western company. I mean. Do you have to work with a local partner? Is it possible to do anything on your own in the market if it's maybe just on iOS? Um, what's, uh, you know, what's the sort of feedback there? Is it essentially, is at this point, essential to work with a partner or required, I guess I'd say? It's legally required, but practically, you can launch your game on iOS and Steam without any local partner because Apple gets away with not enforcing the ISBN rule. For now, at least. For now, at least, yeah. You can just enter one, two, three, four, five as your ISP, and they, they let you pass it. And you can launch your game in China on iOS. But then, for if you want to capture the the other 80% of the market, which is Android, then you have to work with a local partner. Uh, no channel such as uh, 360 dares to publish your game without the ISBN. And so, and also on Wii game as well. Uh, it's a Chinese company, Tencent owns Wii game, and they don't dare publishing your game without ISBN as well, but Steam and, and uh, iOS get away with it now. So, and then in terms of working with a partner, like what are the main sort of areas that you guys are supporting developers with in terms of different operational errors? Is it just focus on like the distribution? Are you guys taking source code and changing the games? Like, What's kind of the be what value are you adding in that equation when you're working with Western companies? Assuming you can start down there, yeah. Yeah, so we, we typically don't ask for source code. Uh, we typically trust our partners to implement any changes that we uh, in, you know suggest to them to get into the market. Um, yeah, but by all means, we we trust the developers to do to do their jobs. Um, and for us, we will handle a lot of the networking support, billing, platform support. Uh, it really helps to have a, a large uh, partner like, like 360 to uh, support you in like the Android market, for example, um, because we can kind of consolidate a lot of the expenses that are going to be there and uh, help promote your game in a more like effective fashion. And you guys have your own sort of PC distribution too, right? That's so correct, I think yeah. It'd be helpful, I think, to have context to with like the antivirus and how you're installed on like every computer and yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, the antivirus software is widely used. Uh, it's a significant. It's the number one leader in, in online security for PC. So we're able to uh, utilize the users' installed games and help them track them, launch them, uh, optimize them. Uh, we run a lot of the, the game optimization tools that someone might expect in like a PC client. Um, so we're able to, to be a great distribution uh, channel for PC ga PC games. Cool. What What are some other stuff you guys are doing to help uh, when you work with Western? Developer and Chinese market. 
uh, with regard to source code, uh, CMG is very flexible. It really depends on the developer's intention. If they want, we can take it over. That may reduce, I mean, significantly reduce a turn turnaround uh, in the localization process. If they do not want to share the source code, we're okay. We simply provide very detailed lo localization requirements to the developer to finish the work. So we are very flexible. And uh, in addition to that, we take care of almost everything else, like marketing promotion, like store relations featuring, and the government relations, the approval process, SBN, publication number, and uh, also customer service and uh, community management, everything we take care of. Okay, uh, I think there's one thing I, I, I can add. Uh, if you want to release games in China, especially for the Android market, that means uh, there are so many different Android markets. So normally that means you, uh, developer have to provide a lot of different uh, install package. So uh, normally, like Lancon, we can help you to, to, to uh, do that. And in the meantime, there are so many different devices as well. So if you want to change your games, uh, adjust your games to, to, to fit these different devices that also need a lot of efforts or resources or few uh, people to do that. So in this kind of angle, we can also help. Okay. Um, in terms of source code, we sometimes take source code, such as uh, Temple Run, Subway Surfers. We not only do the translation, we also create uh, content specific to the Chinese market. We uh, create a, a great wall map for Temple Run. And also sometimes we use local IP. We use Bruce Lee as a, as a runner for Temple Run, for example. And sometimes we don't take source code, such as some indie games. Uh, they are good as it is. Not much change has to be made. So uh, in, that, in that case, we don't need a source code. So uh, we, we are doing everything a publisher should do. Um, store relations featuring, uh, compatibility testing for different devices, uh, SDK integration for all the Android channels, uh, marketing, user acquisition, analytics. Cool. And so uh, yeah, we haven't ta talked much about Android. So um, you know, for those who might be unfamiliar, I mean, uh, obviously there's a huge number of Android channels in Chinese market. Um, you know, how many are you guys supporting when you're releasing a, a you know a, a maybe a higher potential game? Are you 10, 30, 50, like roughly? Like I know there's a lot of consolidation. How many of those channels are you guys kind of supporting with a release, just to give context to the complexity? Um, it's actually 200. Do you support all? Are you, do you? Yeah, we have um, uh, um, like a turnkey solution, like all-in-one SDK that can turns out. So you support all 200? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Similar. The, the big ones are the phone manufacturers, the the mobile hardcore alliance, uh, the Huawei, Xiaomi, um, Oppo, Vivo. Those are the big ones, and then there are also the big internet stores, uh, Tencent, My App. 360, Baidu, those are the big ones. But then there are also, also sm smaller ones, which we also support. Are you guys also, I know you're kind of exclusive, so do you guys also supporting like 200 channels, or have you scaled down? Well, it, it really depends on the game itself. I mean, for, I think for make core hardcore games, you know, like our long-term cash cow games, you know, with months of revenue over, I mean, $10 million? Something we cover all the major channels, and um, some of them are traditional, you know, channels like Baidu, like Tencent, like uh, 360. Some are hardcore channels, like you mentioned. Uh, I mean, those channels are all stores owned by the smartphone manufacturers, like Xiaomi, Huawei, Oppo, things like that. But for lighter games, it is not worthwhile to cover all the channels. May not even 30, 50, let alone 200. We will just handpick some, you know, Android channels for the to to best fit the game to maximize the return on investment. Otherwise, may may not get you the money back, considering the effort and time you spend on the SD SDK, you know, integration. That's our practice. Got it. And then, in terms of PC side, do you just focus on your own distribution, or you support like look at Steam and Wii game as well, or how does that? I know it's complex since you kind of have your own. 
Yeah, it's sort of complicated. Uh, uh, as, as Henry mentioned, the Steam situation is sort of very interesting in China. Um, so we can have games on Steam, uh, but we do uh, require exclusivity um, for approved titles in China uh, on our platform. So, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to remove the title from, from Steam. Uh, do, you, do you use those to publish on, or you just focus on your direct distribution to use it to reach users for games that you say maybe aren't on Steam or that are brand new in the market? Do you focus on publishing on all those pop? Are there, and are there other PC distribution channels, or those are kind of the main ones? Uh, well, I mean, Wii Game is probably the, the biggest, um, but we we are open to having uh, even games that we don't publish on our platform. So uh, what we want to do is create more of like an open marketplace where we can actually promote games that uh, may or may not be on the platform. Um, so that's something that we are, we are offering to a lot of partners is um, being able to direct traffic to a lot of those games. Um, so be a central game hub for um, a lot of gamers. Cool, so I think you know, the next logical question is you know, what are you guys looking for? So in terms of the type of games that you're interested in bringing into market, um, you know, for a while, it was a lot of the top-grossing games, at least on mobile. Now it seems like there's some diverse, diversifying to like indie games, maybe even premium games. Um, in terms of the genre, like other characteristics, like what kind of stuff is interesting for you guys from Western Western developers to bring into the market? Um, so maybe you want to start on the PC for me. Uh, yeah, I mean, from PC side, we're we're basically seeing a a, a sea of Battle Royale games, which is to be expected. Um, I think even on mobile, that's sort of the situation, right? Um, so what we're looking for is games that are going to help evolve the genre. And it certainly is a genre now. It's not just a feature. Um, so that's sort of what we're looking for, is something that's going to differentiate. And what's likely going to happen is that it's going to differenti differentiate so much that it's going to be a different game genre altogether. Um, and so we're looking for something that is going to push the envelope, capture the audience that's so big right now with games like PUBG, H1Z1. Um, and help grow that into something different and something that we can um, help build into like a really strong MMO. I mean, also MMORPGs are something that we're really looking closely at as well. Um, it's really big in Asia and also um, still really strong in, in the West as well. Well, CMG look for, always look for high quality games and IPs from Western countries. Also, I mentioned that the, in the top 10 or top 20, you know, the Mako hardcore games are dominated by local Chinese companies. But we still look for high quality games. Doesn't matter which genre, it's make or hardcore or light games. And I mean high quality by, I mean specifically, the gameplay should be attractive and addictive. And monetization should be profitable and high quality arts and graphics. Okay. Uh, currently, uh, Lancome is uh, developing our own MMORPG games. So for this genre, normally we, we, we take care of ourselves. So uh, if we want to license in games, we prefer uh, games which can uh, help us to build up um, like a high day active users. That means that, that, that kind of genre is we are lacking on. So as our games with some eSports elements inside, uh, that's our next um, strategy we want to develop. So if you have this kind of genre or these kind of games, welcome to talk to me. <laughs> so, um, under Arjun Sky, there are different studios. There's one studio in charge of runner games, like Temple Run and Subway Surfers. One studio in charge of Match 3 games. Um, they are on Gardenscape and Toy Blast, and another studio on strategy games. We're publishing Guardian Kingdoms, uh, 3v3 real-time strategy games. And then uh, we also look for indie titles. Um, across the board, all we look for is innovative gameplay. Um, I mean, I agree with Ringo, like you have to be high quality, but what does it mean by high quality? Uh, I think what we define high quality is innovative. It has to be new. Uh, we're not looking for a full feature set. If you, if you want to crank out like, a bunch of features, I think Chinese do that better than anybody else. But then sometimes uh, what the Chinese lack is to think outside the box. And uh, like Blue Ninja is done by an uh, Australian developer, Angry Birds by a Finnish developer. And that's what we, what we look for. I mean, I think Ch we think Chinese, sometimes they play too conservative. They stick to a successful genre. Uh, I think that's sometimes that's how uh, a decision-making process works in a big company. 
Um, that's why we, when we look to the West, we look for innovation. And how do you evaluate, I mean, uh, how heavily do you weigh like the monetization or performance in the West? Is that an essential component or is the innovation um, more important? Or how, do you, how are you weighing those two things? Because obviously there's a ton of indie, like innovative games that revenue-wise have not performed that well. Like, curious for those, on, especially on the mobile side. Um, we look for innovation first. I think monetization, Chinese does that better than anybody. And yeah, like a, a co-founder in Adam Sky once, once said, um, the Koreans are very good at visual effects, uh, Japanese are good at storytelling, Westerns game gameplay, but Chinese, they, they're good at making money. So we like to take a game that has great innovative gameplay and we can talk to developer about how to monetize it. I know you're doing a lot with indie games. Is that, do you look at uh, gameplay innovation over past performance and revenue? Or how important is revenue performance? Well, for indie games, we do not value so much on the KPIs because we look for brand new games that hadn't been launched. If you have soft launch KPI, that, that will help, but it's not the key. And our you know, evaluation process, we try to minimize the uh, turnaround. It should be within one or two weeks to give the developer feedback as soon as possible. And uh, our internal evaluation spreadsheet is super complex, you know, a few pages, you know, weighted average, you know, different diagrams, footprint diagrams, things like that. But I think the essence still goes to gameplay, art, and monetization. And uh, we don't, I don't, I don't think we can help much on gameplay, right? That's, that's your game, but we can help on monetization. So gameplay, uh, gameplay and art, that's the most two Im important things that we are looking at. Cool. Um, so we're getting close. We'll, I'll take some questions here in, in a couple minutes. Um, so we'd love to get some insights around uh, how either your companies or the market in general is like viewing like the West. Um, obviously, we're seeing more companies you know, trying to bring content in, whether it's you know, Tencent, with you know honor of kings or just um, you know your own efforts to publish games globally, um, how do you feel like Chinese companies are viewing like the Western market, whether it's PC or mobile? Um, any sort of thoughts around that? Kind of where the perception is. Uh, I think for us, it's actually really interesting um, that the the Chinese market is much more hungrier for Western content than it has been in previous years. Um, and uh, you know, I've, I've mentioned a couple times, but Battle Royale has been sort of interesting in that, like it has transcended just the the West and is now one of the big players in both mobile and PC. Um, and you're seeing very successful titles, and then MOBAs as well, very large success uh, in the West, having uh, continued to have success in, the, in Asia as well. Um, and with the trend of premium games coming to to China and being successful there, it's uh, it's very interesting as a Westerner to sort of see this uh, this success over there. And um, my colleagues are absolutely asking for more content like that. Cool. Other thoughts on you guys, companies, are you doing things globally now for content or bringing, trying to bring stuff over to the Western market? Okay, uh, from our company's perspective, I think, um, to be honest, I, th I think Ch Chinese uh, game developers, uh, it's, it's hard to, to develop suitable content for the worldwide in the very beginning. So. Right now, we are looking for co-dap with uh, Japanese companies and uh, uh, Western companies. Since that, we know that uh, it's hard to, to, to build up this kind of content immediately. So uh, in the meantime, we are game developers. So that means we, we, we know that how to like, work with other developers and uh, try to integrate um, both sides trends together, like uh, Western com uh, companies or Japanese company, they can focus on get, uh, like our uh, art design, like um, uh, this kind of uh, perspective. For Ch Chinese company like Lan Kong, we focus on game development, like source code or monetization or this kind of social interactive systems inside the game. So I think we try to combine different trends together. That's one way. Well, uh, quite a lot of Western developers told me that Chinese market is, is very tough. And uh, vice versa, I think for Chinese companies, Western market is also tough, very tough. And CM, CM try like 
about two years ago, a self-published action RPG game in the US. We just, get, just roughly got ends made. So it's tough. I think the big players like Tencent and I, I don't think they, they see success already. Even the latest PUBG mobile clone game by NetEase, I think that's on the top 10 chart, but it hasn't been monetized. So it's tough. For 2018 and going forward, CMG will try both options, self-publishing and find fun, good new sound uh, Western publishing partners. That's our strategy. Um, yeah, a lot of Chinese publishers are looking to the West because right now the user acquisition cost in China is rising too high. Sometimes that's higher than the West. So, um, but then when we evaluate the Western market, we we try to find truly mobile games. Uh, I think the difference between the Western gamers and Chinese gamers is that Chinese gamers they play a lot of hardcore games on their phone. They play like console games, PC games on their phone. Uh, Honor of Kings is actually uh, just like uh, League of Legends, right? It's like League of Legends on the phone. But then we don't feel Western gamers are like that because they are, they have console in their home. They have p powerful PC at their home. They would rather play those games th that belong to the PC and console actually at PC and console. They they play um, truly mobile games. Like Clash of Clans is a truly mobile game. Um, Match 3 is a truly mobile game. So that's what we look for. Cool. So it sounds like the strategy is more collaboration or the co-development or uh, investment types of opportunities. Yeah. I remember in Seattle, we, we talked like we, we, we were uh, we, we had a disagreement. You think Honor of Kings would do well in the West? And I, 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 I didn't think so. You didn't think so? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember I was saying it, it wouldn't do as well because those players who play um, Honor of Kings, they would rather play League of Legends on, on their PC. Yeah, I think that's the different dynamic in China and the West. That's kind of interesting because uh, Honor of Kings is, is very sim like simplistic. Uh, compared to games like Dota or League of Legends, which I'm, I'm very interested in, is that uh, in China they, they prefer the more uh, mid to hardcore game. However, that Honor of Kings and Urban Valor is, is not uh, Valor, yeah, is not that hardcore. It's a little bit more easier to navigate, more accessible. So it's, I think it's pretty interesting. But even for Honor of King, I think it hasn't hasn't met the definition of success, right, in the Western markets. It hit some charts in European countries, but the mar I mean, total market size is still small compared with North America. Yeah, we haven't really seen a very su super successful game come over. Um, although you see sometimes the unlocalized versions pop up in the charts, uh, certain genres. So, uh, question: we're going to do questions now. Hi. Um, great panel, by the way. Um, and you guys mentioned a lot about everyone having a phone and the size of your markets and how... Um, you're looking to genre to diversify your audience. Um, I guess I have a question in particular. Is there any sense in your market um, about including gamers with disabilities in the games that you make? Does that make sense? Something specifically that you had in mind? like? Uh, well, let's say, like, I mean, like, people, let's say you said that there's a lot of, like, Honor of Kings obviously requires, requires a lot of uh, fine motor control. Um, is there a notion of including people who may not have fine motor control or, say, perfect vision or um, optimum hearing in the games that you make? Or do you expect all of your customers to be able-bodied? This might be a little more like outside of my expertise, but I think more than ever, mobile games make things more accessible to people with maybe disabilities, whether it's motor control or vision problems. Uh, you know, scaling uh, resolutions and, and having larger buttons uh, makes it much more accessible for, for players, I think, in that respect. Uh, maybe more complicated for PC and console, but um, yeah, that's sort of my yeah, um, For one of the games, we do try to implement uh, colorblind mode. Yeah. But other than colorblind mode, I don't. I don't think we've ever put of any uh, any more accessibility op option. Hi there. Uh, thank you for a great panel. Um, we are. I'm among one of the indie developers presented the area, and we have an educational game for kids. And I wanted to check if there have been any precedents of 
Western games for kids being published in China and if there is any interest on Chinese market to high quality game for kids, not the fun ones, not like dress and the dolls, but more of the educational and for the younger age, maybe from three to five, three to seven, something like this. So educational games, anyone see like opportunity for that? I know I've looked at this in the past. I just I didn't never came across any companies focused on publishing these type of games. I don't know any other thoughts or have you seen anyone focus on this area in the market? mobile we haven't published any educational games but we do know there is a market uh, my nephew is 11 and he plays some educational games and there are games that are that look like an MMORPG but then you spell out English words to five bosses yeah there are games like that but no companies you know focus on that as a business no okay so yeah, I think this is an opportunity. It's been the same, I looked into this in the last few years, so it's similar, unfortunately. Um, what about AR as a genre? I, I think that uh, NetEase maybe is, is bringing uh, Niantic's Pokemon Go into China, I heard something about that. Are, are, do we, are there other opportunities for AR games, or have you guys uh, seen pitches from people that are producing these games? AR? A lot of games have AR modes. Like one of our games, Makarama, you can navigate uh, the maze in an in a AR setting. But then uh, the, the problem with Niantic is, is not about AR, it's more about the government. The government thinks it's a national security concern to have a, have a Western company accessing the map data. Is that, yeah, so is, is location-based games, can you do, is that, you just can't do it? I mean, or is it just something that nobody's really tried to figure out because of the complexity of the government? Um, I think just a very sensitive issue with China, uh, with the Chinese government. And I guess you have to have very good government relations. You had, like, like Ringo said earlier, like sometimes you have a game denied, uh, but then another game, even more violent, even more sexual, that gets the approval. Sometimes about who you know. All right, one more question over here, if we can. Are there any regulations like uh, COPA compliance uh, in the US to target uh, children in China? And then uh, if not, are there any interesting findings from like the six to 10 or 10 to 12 uh, trends with uh, children that have grown up with phones their whole lives um, that we might not know about over here? So any regulations like we have in the US around privacy with children and things like this isn't there's some s screen like this is honor of kings had to re limit the amount of time you can play or something because is there any specific across like all the entire market for kids there's a anti-addiction mechanic that you, now you ha you are required to implement in your game like you cannot play a game more than six hours at, a, at one setting in one sitting yeah so right six hours long <laughs> So you just have four sittings <laughs> for the whole day. Yeah, I think you, after you play six hours, you have to sit out for a while, okay. maybe two hours, and then you can play again. Some, something like that. Something like that. Okay. Yeah. Cool. We gotta. Sorry, unfortunately, we gotta finish. So if there's other questions, come ask these guys. Otherwise, thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you.